Well, good morning. I hope you're ready to study God's Word, and uh, we have a wonderful gathering of people here today, and uh, uh, I, this is a Roundabout Sunday. Did everybody, did everybody get to go drive on the Roundabout? We've been waiting for that for years and years and years. What do you think? Uh, I hear a lot of murmuring. Oh, I, I loved it. I, I just drove right through. It was so smooth and felt safe. Um, I did. You may not have. I had some. I've had some experience with roundabouts uh, when I when I uh, go to visit my brother in England. Uh, of course, everything's roundabouts over there, and, and it goes the other way. Uh, so I'm used to roundabouts going that way and not this way. But um, uh, I, I don't know. I thought it was great. You'll get used to it. Give it two weeks, and uh, you'll you'll won't know the difference. So it'll be great. But uh, welcome to Roundabout Sunday here at Bellevue Baptist Church. You've been having all kinds of practice anyway. I mean, we built roundabouts in our parking area here. At, of course, you all never follow them. You always go the other way. <laughs> yeah. Either that or a lot of you just like drive right over the grass. Uh, we, we, we haven't been able to keep grass alive uh, on those roundabouts for a long time. So, well... I tell you what, I'm going to be much, uh, much less animated today. I'll probably sit down most of the time. I had hernia surgery on Thursday, and I don't think I'm supposed to be here yet. Um, but it's hard for me to give up the pulpit, and uh, so here I am. Uh, the things that are worse, the, the worst things for me right now is to sneeze, to cough, or to laugh. So, um, so uh, anyway, enough of the jokes. Um, I'm excited about what I am going to share with you today, even if I'm not going to be able to jump up and down and be as animated as usual. I'm excited about it because um, it talks, it, it, it's a message that tells us about the depth, the, uh, the, the, the level at which the gospel can affect our lives. We're in this series called The Gospel. Hear it, believe it, live it. And uh, we've already established what the gospel is, but now what I want us to do is I want us to talk about how the gospel affects us in our everyday life. And, um, and so today we're going to talk about the gospel and the family. The gospel and the family. Uh, our family should be gripped with the gospel. When that happens, it changes the very nature of, of, of how our family operates, how our family experiences life and experiences the Lord. But before I, I dive into this message um, called The Gospel and the Family, I want to talk to you about um, how your family can stand for the gospel and advance the gospel this month here at Bellevue. And this isn't just something of an invitation. This is something of an appeal. I am asking you as your pastor to participate with me and my family in these things. Um, when we talk about the gospel on a Sunday morning in a, in a sermon like a sermon series like this, that's one thing. But teaching should always move into practice. We can't just have instruction or explanation of the gospel. We need to have application of the gospel. We need to be serious about doing the gospel. And so this, this six-week series is all about us learning about the gospel, and then living the gospel. And so there's two things that I want to ask you to, to do. Now, some of you have already started to uh, engage with your life group in uh, missions uh, projects all over our city. And so I'm not talking about that right now. That's something you, many of you have already begun doing. In fact, this Wednesday, our staff is going to be doing our mission project at the International Center here in uh, Owensboro, and we're excited about doing our mission project. But we're, we're having people all over the city, uh, from our church, all over the city, doing missions projects. And so if you're engaged in that with your life group, do that. But there's two other things that I'd like to ask you to do this month. And the first one is, and you're going to hear more about it, and there's a, a little slip of paper where you can RSVP um, to, to this event uh, in your bulletin today. And that is, I'd like you and your family to participate in our missions banquet two Sundays from now on the 17th at 5.30 in the evening. We're we want to line the atrium full of tables and up down the hallways with tables. We want to have a great banquet, and it's going to be a missions banquet. 
and we want you to come, we want you to eat and fellowship, but we are going to inspire you. We're going to feature all of the different missions initiatives that we want to engage in next year. We're going to be bringing people in from the outside to tell us about the opportunities. We're going to be uh, bringing people from the community that we want to support and partner with them in missions and ministry here in this city. And I am so excited about this banquet. we got several people uh, involved in putting it together. And it's going to be an enormous uh, experience. We've never done anything like this before. We've had uh, missions, we've featured missions, testimonies at banquets and stuff. This is different. This is about us as a church gathering together and gearing up and praying about what we're going to do next year. And I really want you to be there. Even if you're somebody that does not usually typically go to a missions event, this is something uh, uh, that, that will, would, would include you, and we want you to be a part of it. And so I'm asking you to come and sign up your family. We're going to uh, provide the opportunities to sign up this Sunday and next Sunday, and you have that RSVP, and I want you to do that. The second thing that I want to ask you and your family to do is to give to our big missions offering. Now, we, we, we're changing the name of our fall missions offering. For years, we've been calling it Christmas for Christ. Starting this year, we're calling it something different. We're calling it the big missions offering. Why? Because it's big, and it's a missions offering. And, and we want it to be bigger than ever before. We want to have a bigger impact than we've ever had before. And that's one of the reasons, and I told you all this two weeks ago, I'm challenging our church to give $80,000 to our missions offering. Now, the only way that can be done is if we all step up and we give more than we've ever given before. If we all say, you know what, the gospel means so much to me, the gospel saved my soul, has come to touch my family so profoundly that we are willing to set aside significant resources to give to the missions thrust of our church so that next year we might do more missions than ever before. Now, two weeks ago, I talked to you about all of the many ways that 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 offering will impact people all over the world and in this city, from uh, or from 75 to 100 orphans in in uh, um, in Haiti to uh, mission trips all over the country to international missionaries that we support all over the world to um, local missions that we'd be partnering with to just a myriad of things, and I shared that with you a couple weeks ago. And you're going to be getting in the mail, if you typically get mail from our church, you should be getting in the mail this week a whole brochure that goes into detail of all the things that that mission offering will go to. When you read it and pray through it, you will go, oh my goodness, there is no place that I could place my offering this year uh, that would have more of an impact than this one big offering. And uh, I think you're going to be moved to give. And, and it's one of the reasons why I, I've, I've tried to challenge you by even saying, listen, pastor will put his money where his mouth is too. And a couple weeks ago I said, I challenged us and, and I said, listen, uh, our family will give $1,000 to this offering. And uh, not everybody can do that. Some people can do more. Um, we, it's really up to what God lays on your heart. But I wanted to be, show you that I'm serious about this. This is an offering that really matters. And uh, I was so blessed because after I gave that challenge, I had a man at, after the service hand me a check for $1,000 to go to the offering early. And, and uh, we're not even challenging people to give to the end of this month, but, but, um, but he, he gave the first $1,000 to the offering. And, and it just goes to show you that people are already capturing a vision for how we could advance the gospel in a huge way through this, what we call the big missions offering. And so I, I'm asking you to begin to pray right now. I mean, listen, Jesus did so much for us by shedding his blood on the cross, dying and, and rising again to be our Savior. He loved us so much that he sent his Holy Spirit to come into our lives to convict us of sin and to draw us to himself that we would accept Jesus, accept his gospel, and have our soul saved. We're going to go to heaven someday. Could we not go to a missions banquet and get excited about missions next year? Could we not, at very least for him, go and set aside more significant resources than we ever have before so that other people might hear the gospel? You see, that's, that's what matters. We need to hear it, we need to believe it, we need to live it. And so I, that's what I'm, I'm asking you to, to join with me and, and join with my family in, and, and other families in the church to, to really do something, not just to come and hear the gospel be preached. That's not your Christian duty. 
okay? That, I mean, just coming here and sitting in a pew in an air-conditioned or heated auditorium, just, I mean, that's not, that is something you're, call, you're expected to do. But that's just, that's, that's the low level. We need to do something with this. And we need to step it up and we need to go ahead and, and we need to start sharing the gospel. But that's going to really mean, we, I mean, if we're going to really be real about that, that means we need to be able to put feet to it and put our money to it. And when we do that, oh my goodness. You know, if we reach uh, uh, $80,000 of the offering or, or more, I mean, honestly, next year will be our biggest missions step forward that we've ever had. And... Um, I want to live that kind of life. I, I want to be a part of that kind of church. Well, if you would, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians chapter 5. The book of Ephesians chapter 5, there in your New Testament. If you don't know where Ephesians is, look in your table of contents there in the Bible and, and uh, find it there. You know, the gospel is more than simply the message that tells us how to be right with God and go to heaven. <clears throat> The gospel is meant radically to save our souls and then radically to shape our lives and relationships. So today I want to talk about the gospel and the family. The family that's gripped with the gospel is a family that will be deeply shaped by the gospel and a family that will powerfully represent the message of the gospel in both words and ways. Now, I want us to review for a moment what is the gospel because the gospel is more than Jesus loves you and has a great plan for your life. The gospel is very specific. What Jesus did for you. What's the gospel? The gospel is this. Though mankind has sinned against holy God and is deserving of his wrath and condemnation, God in his justice and mercy has sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross in our place, to rise from the dead to be our savior. And by turning from our sin, trusting in what Christ did for us and surrendering our lives to him, we can be forgiven our sins, made right with God, and have eternal life. That's the gospel, what Jesus did for us. Now, in our Christian life, the gospel grips us. It justifies it. It, it delivers us from guilt, shame, and from a godless life. But then the gospel so impacts us that it transforms how we relate to others and the meaning behind those relationships. Now, I want us to delve into how, how the gospel shapes and changes us. If we've been gripped with the gospel, if we've been saved by the gospel, accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior because of what Jesus did for us, now how does that change and shape how we do family? Well, before we dive into that, let's pray. Father, saving grace is changing grace. And you have changed us with the gospel so that our families would be fundamentally different. And that our our words and ways would be shaped by your very gospel. Speak to us now and minister to our families because so many times, dear Father, our families struggle. Rally our families around the truth of the gospel that we might overflow with love. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, there's five things I want to talk about today. And the first one is this. When our families are gripped with the gospel, we imitate the love of Christ found in the gospel as we love those in our family. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 2 in your Bible. The Bible says, Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is so simple and yet so utterly radical when, when we are gripped with the gospel, we do not love our family members simply for what they bring to us or the role that they play in our lives or even the, just the simple fact that they're our family and we have to love them. We begin to love them because Jesus first loved us and because Jesus loves them. When you have been gripped with the gospel, your motivation for loving those in your family changes. It shifts. The locus, the anchor point, is, is no longer in what they can do for you or the role they play or even just the fact that you have to love them because they're family. But now you love them because Jesus loves them. You love them because Jesus loved you first and because you've been so overwhelmed and gripped by the love that he's given you that it overflows and you love them as well. And you imitate, you imitate the love of God. 
That word imitate, the definition for imitate is to follow or endeavor to follow an action or manner of another. And what we, what we see what Jesus did to love us and we imitate in our relationship with each other the same in our homes. That is what the Christian is called to do. Now think about it. What did Jesus do for you? First of all, the Bible says right here that he loved us. We're dearly loved children. He loved us. What does that mean? He valued us. He cared for us. He put wor uh, ascribed worth to us. He regarded us. And then what did he do to prove that? He gave himself up for us as a sacrifice to God. That's what the Bible says there in verse 2. He gave himself up as a sacrifice unto the Lord. He sacrificed himself so that we might have life in his name. <laughs> How profound. He sacrificed himself. Now what does that tell us? It tells us that if we're going to be gripped with a gospel that saved our souls, then we must love others with that same kind of love, which means we need to love them. Why? Because God valued us while we were sinners. We value our family members such that he, knowing that, that, that God has given his son for them as well, and so that they have worth. And so we love them because of the worth that God has ascribed to them. And in addition to that, we give of ourselves for our family members as an act of worship to God and a reflection of the nature of God. We're willing to sacrifice things of our life for the sake of our family members. And we do it not because just we want something for our children or we want better for them. We do it out of an act of imitation of the very gospel of Jesus Christ in our life. We do it as a testimony and an example of Jesus. You see, the meanings change. Now it's because Jesus loved me so much and saved me and did so much for me, I too will surrender and sacrifice myself for my family and love them with a sacrificial love. And the second thing, that we're called to do is that if we're gripped as a family, if we're gripped with the gospel, then we're, we're going to flee sinful thoughts and behaviors as we guard <coughs> our testimony of the gospel in our family. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 18 says it pretty clear that we as Christians are meant to not just receive salvation, but we're to live out a testimony that points to salvation. That when we are saved from sin, we're not to go and return to that sin. The Bible says in verse 3, it says, But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For, if this, for of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person such a man as an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. The Bible makes it so clear that we are to flee from sinful behavior, sinful thoughts. Why? Because we are a living testimony of the gospel. Because, and, and as a family, we're to, we're to fulfill this, the, the will of God in our life by, by living this out. Why? Because, because we are a testimony of the gospel to the world. And we need to, as a family, we need to guard our testimony in the world. Because Jesus died for all this nasty sin, because he loved us so much to take on all that himself. We don't want to have anything to do with that junk in our life. And so we flee things like sexual impurity, lust, pornography, coarse joking, ungodly forms of joking. Instead, we engage in thanksgiving. And the whole point is this, not that we would become a, uh, a family that is just sour all the time and all puckered up. and Not that not, not we have to be some, uh, a group of killjoys that never has any good times or any fun. The difference here is of a family that avoids all the things that pushes you away from God and instead engages in all the things that bring you to God and engage you with God. And that's the kind of people that we need to be. And to determine that, you know what, as a family... We're not only a group of people that have accepted the saving grace of Christ, but we're a group of people that must represent the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. Now, we're going to see that here in just a little bit, that God has actually ordained the family to be a picture of the gospel to the world. And we'll look at that in just a moment. But third, 
if we are a family that's gripped with the gospel, we need to be a family that lives a life of rejoicing in the gospel and sharing that joy with one another. Sharing that joy with one another. Look at the lifestyle of the Christian that God expects of us. Look at verse 19. The Bible says, Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible here says that we're to give worshipful recognition of all that God has done for our souls through the gospel, and it ought to become a natural and consistent expression in our relationships with one another. And that would certainly include our relationships with the family. We are to be a people that is constantly has the gospel on our lips, that constantly gives praise to the Lord. We don't have to be weird about it. We just need to be natural about it. It needs to be a natural thing for us to share the fact that Jesus has been good to us, that God has been good, that God should get the glory, that God has saved us. We should talk amongst ourselves and our families about how and review the fact that Jesus has done good things for us, that he cares for us, that he's ministered to us, that he's offered us salvation in the gospel. We ought to rejoice in the fact that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, rose again to be our Savior. We ought to be able to sing and make melody and music in our hearts with one another. That's one of the reasons why we gather here. What have we just done here this morning? We've been doing this very thing. For the last 2,000 years of, of uh, church history, we have been fulfilling this role on Sunday mornings as the church gathers and worships in song and in prayers and in preaching. What are we doing? We're celebrating the gospel. We're celebrating the gospel. We're singing and make music in our hearts uh, we, unto one another about the gospel. And what does it do? It bolsters our faith. It reminds us of the grace that we're in. It enhances our experience of God's blessing in our life. And we are meant to do this. It gives glory to God. And it is a witness to the world. The, 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 the most obvious witness to our city that we are a redeemed people and that God is at work in amongst us is when we gather on the Sabbath. It's when we are the most visible as the body of Christ, where you can go, oh, there's the body of Christ. Look, they've all gathered around Jesus. That, that is, it's the most visible moment of our witness. And we ought to be rejoicing in the gospel when we gather in that way. Now, what does this say to our family? Well, if, if, if it's in a context like this that we gain uh, our greatest opportunities to join with others in in expressing the gospel in this kind of mel melodious way, then um, how, what kind of priority should this have in our life? It ought to have a high priority. Coming to church ought to be have a high priority. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here, so to speak. I mean, you're the ones that most often come to church. The, the fact is, is it's very, very important that 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 we make a real serious priority about being in the church house. Now, I've already said it. This is not the end-all, be-all of the Christian life. Your Christian life is 24-7. I mean, most of your Christian life is going to be lived off this campus, not on this campus. But that we would gather together, is there's a biblical mandate for that. And we need to gather, and your family needs to gather together. And, and you know what? Your family needs to see each other rejoicing in, in the gospel in a public format, un, unhindered by any sense of embarrassment, but to be able to come and to worship together. And we need to do this in our homes, too, to be able to freely talk about the gospel, freely talk about the Lord at the dinner table. You know, when you're spending time with your children or with your spouse, to talk about the Lord naturally. You know, I've always loved how to, to be able to build into my children the gospel uh, when I would tuck them into bed. Now, I don't do that too much with my 15-year-old, 18-year-old, and 20-year-old anymore. But I do with my soon-to-be 7-year-old. I tuck him in and talk to him, about, I talk to him about the Lord last night. And we prayed together last night. And, and I talk about the gospel, even though he's already accepted the gospel in his life and already been baptized. I mean, we still talk about the gospel, what Jesus did. We need to do that very naturally in our homes. To live a life of rejoicing in the gospel. To rejoice. And then fourth, a family that's gripped with the gospel will 
will be a family where we will fulfill our respective roles in the family as a living example and testimony of our relationship with Christ made possible by the gospel. And this is pretty powerful stuff here. We'll take a good look at it. For some reason, God has chosen the family unit to, be, to play a special symbolic role in picturing the gospel to the world. This is where the family really becomes an important witness in the community. For we see here that husbands, wives, and children are spoken of. Three basic components of the average family. And so what I want us to look at is first the role of the husband shaped and gripped by the gospel. And we look at verse 25 of Ephesians chapter 5, and it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Hello. Now, the Bible's going to make clear, in fact, I skipped over the portion about wives because wives are actually dealt with first in this text. I skipped over that and I dealt with husbands first. But we're going to see in the wives section that it says wives submit to the husbands, which indicates that the husband, the intention of God, the intention of God, this is not always what happens because some families are broken and all that, but the intention of God is for the husband to be the head of the home. But oftentimes in our society, in our life, that is interpreted as something of an oppressive thing because there's been much abuse. There's been much abuse, much heavy-handedness. And yet, when you study the Scriptures and you look at verse 25 and you see the role of the husband to exemplify and to embody the gospel in his family, what does it say that the husband's role is? The husband's role is to imitate the role of Christ in the home. In other words, he's to love his spouse and his family. And how is he to display that? He is to sacrifice himself. He is to lay aside things that are only for him to put his family first. Now, it's not so hard to submit to that kind of leadership, servant leadership. But it is hard to submit to dictatorial or oppressive or selfish leadership. But when the husband says, I've been so gripped by grace, so gripped by the gospel, Jesus died for my sins, rose again. He sacrificed everything so that I could have life. And now he's given me, as the husband in this home, he's given me this distinct privileged role of being able to sacrifice and even suffer for my family's sake so that I might do that unto God as a worship to Christ and to give. And to be able to submit one to another in that way. And then the Bible says, wives... Verse 22, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. You see, in God's ideal, his intention is the husband to love with sacrificial provision and protection, his wife. And then his wife then to submit to that provision and protection and to be appreciative for that provision and protection and to honor, honor her husband, for the provision and the protection and the love that she's receiving. Now, it's hard to do that if she's not going to receive that kind of love and support. But when she has it, she should submit to it. And why? Because she is also giving a picture, a picture of the gospel, that there's Jesus who came to surrender to us, but also we come and we honor Jesus in our life. And then there's a role for, G for children to play in picturing the gospel as well. When the Bible says here in verse 1 of chapter 6, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. 
Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise that it may go well with you and you may enjoy long life on the earth. The image here is that we would be a, a, a people, that, that children, that you would obey your parents as an image, as a picture of how we as Christians are to obey our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so while you're under the home and under the obligation of obedience to your parents, for that will not always last. There will be someday you'll be on your own and you will determine your own destiny. But right now you are to be submissive to your parents and obedient to your parents. Why? As a testimony of what we're to be like as Christians in obeying our Heavenly Father. You see, the family is to be a picture, a portrait of the gospel to the world. And so how we live our family is not just for our own mutual enjoyment or our peace of mind or our harmony or our mutual support. It's also as a testimony and a witness to the world. And then lastly, if we're going to be families that are gripped with the gospel, then we... We need to be families that nurture our family's faith in the Lord so that we can stand against the devil's schemes. The Bible says here in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 and following, that we have an enemy, the devil, that prowls around and seeks to destroy and to target us. The Bible says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. What is the Bible saying? The Bible saying that as families, we need to nurture our faith in the Lord so that we can stand against the devil's schemes. The Bible says it in terms of putting on the armor of God. What does it mean to put on the armor of God? What does it mean to put on the belt of truth? Well, it means to have your faith in God's word. Place your faith in God's word. What does it mean to put on the breastplate of righteousness? It means to trust in the righteousness of Christ, to have your faith in what Jesus did for you and, have, and, and to walk in that righteousness. What does it mean to put on the helmet of salvation? It means to trust what Jesus did for you on the cross. It means to believe the gospel so that you would not be uprooted in, and, and, and fall into shame and disgrace. It, it means that you trust God. And what we need to do as a family is to nurture one another's faith. That's what it means to put on the full armor of God. And we need to pray on all occasions and support one another in prayer and, and strengthen one another. This is important, church. Because there is a devil, devil that prowls around us like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour, looking for a weak link in our families. And that's why we need to stand for the family. It's one of the reasons why um, some time back... You know, this past year, our, our church did a, a study on the family and concluded that one of the things we've got to do is we've got to build strong, godly families in the future because it's so critical to the testimony of the gospel. And so I ask you this day, I ask you about your family. And you may be a family unit of one. You may be a single. You may be a couple without children. You might be somebody whose uh, 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 your, your family has, has your, your marriage is broken, but you still have family, and uh, you're raising children on your own. It may be that, uh, that, that you're a, a family that's the typical, uh, typical nuclear family. You may have a lot of kids. You may have a few kids. You may have no kids. I don't know what, where, where you are in your family, but you know every family has challenges. And would you submit your family to the gospel? Would you say, our family, as for me and my household, we're going to live out the ways of the gospel. We're going to example 
the gospel and imitate our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to play the roles that we need to play. We're going to submit to one another and to the Lord. And we're going to show the love of Jesus, the love of Christ, because Jesus loved us so much that he shed his blood on the cross and rose again. So we're going to love our family members with that kind of sacrificial love. Would you bow with me in prayer? Almighty God, we thank you that you have loved us and that you've given us life in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Lord, you have shown us such an amazing love in Jesus. And you have called us, dear Father, to imitate that love in our families. For some of us, we have been so gripped with selfishness that we have not loved one another well and our families are hurting. Perhaps today is the day that each of us individually can make a determination that we're going to love as Jesus loved us. And in doing so, we're going to testify to the truthfulness of the gospel in our lives. And we'll manifest the gospel in our families. Father, if there's somebody here today that's yet to receive Jesus and respond to the gospel, Lord, may today be the day they accept Christ as their Savior there be somebody here today that's not joined the life of our church, dear Father, and needs to be a part of the life of the body of Christ, Lord, may today be the day they give their life over to the commitment of uh, membership to the church. Father God, I pray in Jesus' name that you do something powerful in our midst. Maybe there's somebody here that just needs to surrender to you, their selfishness, and just lay it down and just say, Lord, I, I'm going to pick up the cross of sacrifice and I'm going to start loving the people around me with the sacrifice of Jesus. Lord God, do a work in each of us that we might respond as you have called us to respond. In Christ's name.